This is Evangelist Henry Walker. Welcome to the podcast. I want to start a new message today talking about the mark of the beast. Could it be connected to a wealth transfer and gold? But let's go to the Father in prayer first. Father, I thank you for another opportunity to minister to your people, Father. I ask you to use me just the way you want, Father. Let me say only what you want me to say, nothing more and nothing less. Help people, Father, to open up their spirits and not only receive the word, but study the word for themselves. And Father, we give you all the praise and the honor, Father, in the mighty name of Yeshua, by the blood of Yeshua. Please turn with me to Exodus chapter 3. Again, we're talking about could the mark of the beast be connected to a wealth transfer and gold. Exodus chapter 3, verse 20. So, so many people are talking about Nasara, just Sarah, National Economic Security and Recovery Act, the Global Economic Security and Recovery Act. And it sounds like something that the Antichrist would use to win people to himself. Because it says in Revelation 13, that he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, to receive that mark. He didn't say he forces. It says he causes. Remember, the love of money is the root of all evil. I believe the Antichrist is putting something in front of people to win them all to him. All. He causes all to take that mark. Now, this is chapter 3. Verse 20, here's a wealth transfer that was from the Father. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I'll give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it shall come to pass that when you go, you should not go empty. But every woman shall borrow the word borrow. That's the debt that the children of Israel had to the Egyptians. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourn in her house, jewels of silver and jewels of gold and clothing. And you shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and you shall spoil the Egyptians. Exodus chapter 12, verse 36. And Yahweh gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. They lent. They lent gold, silver, and clothing to the Egyptians. Children of Israel, in Exodus chapter 14, you know how the Red Sea was opened by the Father for his people and he closed it on the Egyptians. And you realize that the debt of a whole nation was canceled at the Red Sea. So this is a wealth transfer from the Egyptians to the children of Israel. And all debts were canceled. And part of this in the Sarah and Jesarah, and some of you, this is a new term, but research it. You're not going to find it on the mainstream news. You have to go on the internet. Part of this plan is that there be no taxes, just a 15% sales tax. All debts will be canceled. It'd be like a utopia, no wars, peace. It'd be like an imitation of the millennium, the thousand year period of time where we'll be with Yeshua in Jerusalem, worshiping him as the king. Be no wars, the time of peace. And if you go to Exodus 32 with me, see everything about this Antichrist person is gold. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar had that statue of himself, gold, and the three Hebrew children, Ananiah, Azariah, Mishael, refused to bow down to that golden statue. In Exodus chapter 32, verse 1, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto them, up, make us gods, which shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. See, there'll be a change in leadership. What's happening right now, the leadership that's in the United States right now is going to be changed. Somebody else is going to take over. And that person, I believe, will be the Antichrist. And everything about that person is gold. Money, money, money. And this Antichrist is going to use money to entice people to swear allegiance, to take an oath of allegiance to him. 
It's all part of the process of getting this money. And all this money has been built up over centuries. Funds that were set aside, and also with Solomon's gold, which we'll talk about later on. It sounds so far out there, but it, I believe it's real. Because it, it is something that the Antichrist will use to show that they think he's good, and after a while he's just going to turn. And everything that's happening in the United States and the world with wars and so forth, that somebody's going to come in and say, hey, I'm going to change this whole thing. And so here in that, the savage of Sarah, it's like humanity is going to help humanity. How can humanity help humanity? The only person that can help humanity is Yeshua. In verse 2, and Aaron said unto them, break off the golden earrings. This is the money transfer they got. Which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me. And all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molden calf. And he said, These be gods of Israel which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is the feast to Yahweh. He's calling this golden calf Yahweh. And he made offerings to it. And the father told Moses, go down and see what these people are doing. And see, Aaron lied in verse 24. Aaron said to Moses, I said unto them, whosoever had any gold, let them break it off. So he gave it to me, then I cast it into the fire, and they came out to his calf. No, no, he made it. It said earlier that he fashioned it by his hands. In verse 31, and Moses returned unto Yahweh and said, oh, this People have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. So if you go with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, in verse 1 it talks about the first beast. I believe this Antichrist person is going to re replace somebody else, replace and take that position. And in reality, he's working right now and the whole world will be under him. But he's trying to do a comparison of what's happening right now and what I can do. So it talks about the first beast. From verse 1 to 11. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spoke as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. And causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast. Whose deadly wound was healed. See the deadly wound of the first beast. is Now he's picking it up. This antichrist is picking up from the first beast. And it's just going from bad to evil. Bad to worse. And he does great wonders so that he make fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. That sounds like the military. That John is looking at this. It could be rockets coming from a plane. So this Antichrist is going to have the military behind him. And he deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and the lip. So he's taking over for the first beast. And he had power in verse 15 to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And as we mentioned before in verse 16, and he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that had understanding count the number of the beast, for it is a number of a man, and his number is 666. There's two other situations in the word where the number 666 is mentioned. In 2 Chronicles 9, verse 13, you can write it down, in 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14. 2 Chronicles 9, verse 13, and 1 Kings 10, Verse 14, it's talking about Solomon, how every year he has 666 talents of gold delivered to him. Over 40 years, that's a lot of gold. And he actually made the shields with three pounds of gold. Gold is selling by the ounce. Imagine with three pounds, every shield. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 17. I want to talk about Solomon. Deuteronomy is right at the Leviticus numbers, Deuteronomy 17. Here's the father's telling his people, this is the king I want you to have. 
In verse 14, Deuteronomy 17, verse 14, When you are come into the land which Yahweh your Elohim giveth you, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and, and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me, thou shalt in any wise set him king over you, whom Yahweh your Elohim shall choose. One from among your, your brethren shall thou set king over you. Thou mayest not set a stranger over you, which is not your brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses, for as much as Yahweh has said unto you, you shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Now go with me to 1 Kings. Go to the right to 1 Kings. Right after 2 Samuel, 1 Kings chapter 10. Again, talking about Solomon. Talking about gold. 1 Kings chapter 10. I told us in the very beginning about the fame that Solomon had in verse 1. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of Yahweh, she came to prove him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices, and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. There's not anything hid from the king which he told her not. And she was so impressed with his wisdom. In verse 14, as we talked about before, now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Again, that's mentioned in Revelation 13. Beside that, he had of the merchantmen and of the traffic of the spice merchants and of all the kings in Arabia and of the governors of the country. So it's more than 666 talents of gold. And King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold, 600 shekels of gold went into one target. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three pounds of gold went to one shield, as I mentioned before. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the best gold. In verse 21, And all King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None was silver. It was nothing accounted. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. He counted all the silver as stones, nothing, worth nothing. That's how much gold he had. For the king had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. In verse 26, this is just what the father said to children of Israel. Don't have a king doing this. In verse 24, and all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom. The whole earth, type of the Antichrist, to hear his wisdom, which the father had put in his heart. And he brought every man his present, vessels of silver and vessels of gold and garments and armor and spices and horses and mules, a rate year by year. And Solomon gathered together in verse 26, chariots and horsemen. And he had a thousand and four hundred chariots and twelve thousand horsemen, whom he bestowed in the cities for chariots with the king of Jerusalem. So he's about ready to have his downfall. Chapter 11, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, and other nations concerning which Yahweh said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Verse 7, Then did Solomon build a high place for Shemas, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Moloch. They used to offer children to Moloch. Moloch is all about abortion, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And Yahweh was angry with Solomon, verse 9, because his heart was turned away from Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. So this Antichrist is going to raise himself up as the Savior, the one that's going to save the world. And so many people are going to sign up for this money transfer, this wealth transfer, and they're going to have to, again, as I mentioned, they have, they're going to have to take an oath of allegiance 
to this Antichrist. It'd be kind of be camouflage. But they say that you just go in for the meeting and you have to do a biometrical scan of a finger. See, the mark in Revelation 13, the mark in the right hand or in the forehead, the only translation that has the word in is the King James Version. All other translations have on. So it seems that to get this money transfer, they have to do a biometrical finger reading to identify the person. And it's so much money for humanitarian causes. It all sounds so good. It sounds all utopian. But I believe it's connected to the mark of the beast. Again, because it's the mark on the right hand. And it's that finger scan that they do. Important for you to realize this, that I believe all this stuff is going to happen with the Antichrist and the wealth transfer and the gold. But it's important to, to notice before the rapture, to warn people, make sure that you're not involved in it. And see, every nation wants to go back on the gold standard. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but such an emphasis on gold right now. So, if you go back with me to the book of Exodus chapter 19, it says that nobody can buy or sell without taking the name of this beast. And that's like a, a marriage ceremony where most women will take the, the name of their husbands in marriage. In Exodus chapter 19, the father chose the children of Israel. In verse 3, Exodus chapter 19, verse 3. And Moses went up unto Elohim, and Yahweh called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, which are the Ten Commandments, which is going to be mentioned in the next chapter. Then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a set-apart nation. These are the words which I shall speak unto the children of Israel. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their faces all these words which Yahweh commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that Yahweh has spoken we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto Yahweh. It's like a, a, a wedding ceremony. I do. I do. In chapter 20, it's recorded he made a contract with his people. The Ten Commandments. And see, the Ten Commandments were never done away with. Yeshua came not to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. And he summarized the Ten Commandments by saying, Love the Father with all your heart, mind, and spirit. And then, love your neighbor as yourself. But in verse 7, Exodus chapter 20, Thou shalt not take the name of Yahweh your Elohim in vain, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Part of the contract is, don't take my name in vain. And his name is Yahweh. I am that I am. And when you surrender everything to the Father, and you believe that Yeshua died for you, and you ask the Father to come into your spirit, to fill you with his spirit, mortifying the deeds of your flesh, making you more and more like Yeshua, and bringing the fruit of the spirit out of your life, you belong to him. And that name Yahweh is an action verb. He actively moves on your behalf. And Satan has tried to block that for 1,700 years, started with Constantine, who had the spirit of Antichrist around him and maybe even in him. And so that's why it says in Revelation 13 to take his name. It's like they're marrying the Antichrist. They're marrying Satan by taking his name as a mock. And here the Israelites are entering into a marriage covenant with the Father. And we are the bride being married to Yeshua. You can write this down in Matthew 9, verse 14 to 15. Matthew 9, verse 14 to 15. Ephesians 5, verse 25 to 27. Ephesians 5, verse 25 to 27. So we're taking the name of Yahweh in our lives as a marriage contract. And those people taking the mark of the beast are taking the name of Satan, the Antichrist, into a marriage with the kingdom of Satan. If you go to Deuteronomy, just go to the right to Deuteronomy, this mark, I believe, is a spiritual mark. Because in that whole wealth transfer based on gold, that's been accumulated over so many centuries. 
It's all based on a spiritual mock allegiance to the Antichrist. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our Elohim is one Yahweh. Remember, Revelation 4, 2, it is one sitting on the throne. And thou shalt love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Just what Yeshua said. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. And you shall teach them diligently unto your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontless between your eyes. You shall write them upon the post of your house and on your gates. So it's, it's on the right hand, and it's on the forehead, a spiritual mark. See, we want to keep his word in our minds. Our minds is where we make decisions, and our right hand is, is concerned with actions, what we do for him. And people who surrender everything to Satan, his name, the Antichrist name, is in their minds, and he gives them certain power, but he takes that power away when he's finished with them. But we have access to the Father who can pour out all power through us. It's that right hand of power. Yeshua said, Hereafter you shall see me sitting at the right hand of power. We get that term right hand man. Remember, the Father we're going to see throughout eternity is in the face of Yeshua sitting on that throne. There's one throne. And Yeshua is at the right hand of the power of the Father. Again, it's a Jewish term where we get the right hand man. And Deuteronomy 11, so it's a spiritual mark. It's a spiritual allegiance. And a name goes along with the marriage. The father's name, Yahshua. And the Antichrist's name is, is going to be in the mind of so many people that take that mark. Deuteronomy 11, verse 18. Therefore shall you lay up these words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that you may be as frontless between your eyes. See, it's in the heart and in the mind, the mark. The mark of the Father versus the mark of the beast. A message on my website, henrywalker.org, about the mark of the Father versus the mark of the beast. So again, we're his bride. We take his name. If you go back to Revelation chapter 14, to overcome the people who have been going through the Great Tribulation. Revelation 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of Elohim and the faith of Yeshua. In 15, Revelation 15, verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over the image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the hops of the Father. See, you overcome him by keeping the Father's commandments and not worshiping any other God. And this whole mark of the beast is, again, is swearing allegiance, taking an oath to the Antichrist. Like in chapter 14, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount of Zion, and with him 144,000, having his Father's name written in their foreheads. What is the Father's name? It's Yahweh, Yahshua. Yahshua means Yahweh our Savior. When Yeshua was riding into Jerusalem on that donkey, they were saying Hosanna, which is a term that only applies to the Father, and it means, oh, save us, oh, save us, recognizing him as the Savior. Isaiah 43, verse 11, the Father says, beside me there is no Savior. So this Antichrist is going to come on the scene like the Savior. it be like a wolf in lamb's clothing. So it's important that you warn people. It's important that you're alert to what's being talked about so much. Again, you're not going to see it in the mainstream news, but it's there. I believe it's an excellent possibility because it sounds like something that the Antichrist would use, as I mentioned before, to win people to himself. By having like a, a fake millennium, a counterfeit millennium. There's peace, utopia, everybody is in peace. And humanity is going to help humanity. It just ain't going to happen. It's going to start off like that with the Antichrist, but wow, watch what he does later on. You see, the word mark in the Strong's Concordance, one of the meanings of it is symbolic, it's figurative, 
It's a connection between two parties. And another word that's connected to it is sealed. Ephesians 1, verse 13 to 14, we are sealed with the Spirit of the Father. And so this mark is going to seal people to the Antichrist, to Satan himself. Revelation chapter 19, and verse 6, And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunder, and saying, Hallelujah! For Yahweh Elohim, omnipotent, all-powerful, reigns, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife had made herself ready. So it's important to realize that we're going to marry Yeshua. He's our bridegroom, we're the bride, and that wedding feast, right after the rapture, would be seven years, that wedding feast with Yeshua. But the enemy wants people to marry him with that mark of the beast, taken upon his name. But in chapter 22, Revelation chapter 22, verse 10, And he said unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. Do you understand the time is at hand? He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is set apart, let him be set apart still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Warn people and make sure you, you don't get caught up in this plan of the Antichrist. I feel like the Father wants me to speak these words to some of you out there. Number one is to wait on him. Don't rush and make a, a rush decision. Wait on him. Just wait, 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 and haven't done all wait. We need to rest in him. Everything's in the Father's hands. He controls everything. And as we pray, let's pray according to his word. Stand on his word. But before we come back to the message, I want to remind some of you that this is a pro-life ministry. We believe that life begins at conception. The Father is the agent of conception. He causes conception. And most scientists believe that life begins at conception. And remember, the baby's in the womb, their heart begins to beat around 18 days. And around four months, their hearts are pumping about 25 quarts of blood per day. So every podcast, I pray for the babies in the womb. And if you want to join me, Father A should touch the babies in the womb, bring them to a full birth, Father, and we give you all the praise and the honor, Father, in the mighty name of Yeshua, by the Bloody Yeshua. And if any of you out there had an abortion, repent, ask the Father to forgive you, and go on serving Him in your purpose and destiny, and don't look back. And also, that I mention every podcast, if your flesh is giving you thoughts of fear, worry, anxiety, impure thoughts, thoughts that are not from the Father, just say out loud, thank you, Yeshua, for the crown of thorns around your head, that was for me. That means that my mind is protected by your blood. I only think your thoughts and give those thoughts to the Father. So if you enjoy these podcasts, tell other people about these podcasts, share, subscribe, hit the like button, and remember to next time. This is Avengers Henry Walker saying, Greater is the Father in you, your daddy, the king of the universe than anything or anybody in the world.